Thank you, Lord. So I give you permission to be who God's called you to be. And let's break out of familiarity and business as usual. Let our lights shine and touch other people and watch them be encouraged and, and built up. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. All right, worship team, I'll, I'll let you go for a moment. I'm going to try and preach. <laughs> the marriage conference, in my personal opinion, was over the top uh, this, this weekend. Uh, I thought that was incredibly powerful. Mike and Diane Thompson, uh, their two boys, and Lilia. Whew. It was just so rich and so, so very, very good. Uh, if you missed it, you'll have to believe God for another one soon and, and somewhere else. I was like, Lord, it, I was overwhelmed, actually. I couldn't take notes fast enough. And finally I said, I'm just going to quit taking notes and trying to absorb it. And then somebody would say something, and I'm locked in right there. And you miss the next 10 minutes. Just so good. Well, it's going to be good this morning, too. They call today Palm Sunday. And I want to focus on the grand display of the meekness of God. You know, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you, you've seen the Father. So I read a statement like that, and I go, oh, wow, that's, that's really good. But let's think about what he's saying. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. See, an undercurrent of truth in those words are, I have come to reveal the Father to you. Right? So Jesus says, if you've seen me, I, you've seen the Father. He's really saying the purpose that I am here is to reveal who the Father is and how the Father feels about you. So if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I, I want you to see me is what Jesus is saying. I want you to see what I do. I want you to hear my heart because when you see what I do and you hear what I say, it's exactly how my Father in heaven feels about you. So as we look at this Palm Sunday this morning, I want your eyes to be opened as to what is it that Jesus wants me to see about the Father today? And I'm going to be focused on His meekness. When you look at Palm Sunday, it's, it's like the gate has opened for the end and the new beginning. It's like all of eternity was focused and braced on this event right here at the start of Passover. That Jesus is coming into town. And there, I looked up one little phrase this morning that Jesus says, the hour has come. You've read that before, right? The hour has come. He says it's like five or six times in the Gospels, it's like four times, I think, in the book of John itself. The hour has come. What Jesus is saying is the, the time that the Father appointed for my life and for you happens now. It's not going to be tomorrow. It's not going to be next week. The time has come. The hour has come. So what Jesus is about to do is so powerful and so magnificent 
and so awe-inspiring. He and his disciples are in Jericho, and they start the move towards Jerusalem. Now, the interesting thing is that when he leaves Jericho, he leaves with a very large contingency of Galileans. Do you remember when the, uh, I think it's John, John and Luke both say, they ask the question, the crowds in Jerusalem said, who is this? Because they're looking out, watching this guy on a donkey with this huge crowd around him that's shouting, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. And they're going, who is this? So you got one crowd down there, and, and you know a lot of preachers have preached that it was the fickleness of the Jews that one moment they're praising him and the next moment they want to kill him. But the reality is there was a crowd from Galilee. Let me, let me use this. There was a crowd from Holopal. If you don't know what Holopal is, Google it. There was a crowd from Holopal, and then there was those that lived in Melbourne. And it, it would be like, ooh, be careful, Tim. Be like a bunch of Southerners coming from Holopal. Glory to God in the highest. I, I think I've lost my southern accent. And they would be yelling this out and screaming this out with this southern accent. Because the Galileans had an incredible accent. They didn't sound like the rest of Israel. I'm being serious. So you have one crowd that's shouting, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest. Then you have those Jews who are inside Jerusalem. And they're going, who is this guy? So they're all following Jesus up from Jericho. He gets to these two little villages, Bethany and Bethphage, uh, just outside Jerusalem. And there he gets seated on uh, a, a donkey. He's put on this donkey, and it's maybe three-quarters of a mile from the top of Mount of Olives to the eastern gate. So he sits down on this donkey, and the crowd of Galileans, you know, the ones with the strange accent, are all starting to go, it's now. Messiah is about to reveal himself as the one who will throw Rome out of here. They're, they don't understand yet that Jesus wasn't coming to throw Rome out. Jesus was coming to throw sin out. So he's riding on this donkey and the crowds are gathering. They start to take off their jackets and they gather branches. They throw them on the road while he is, he is coming uh, up, up the way. They're calling him son of David. They're shouting, Hosanna. And Jesus is enjoying it. Not because he needed them to do that, but because it was true. Jesus was now announcing, I am the king. I am the king of kings. And the Lord of Lords. And the fact that he is on a donkey riding in was really symbolic because a king would ride into town on a donkey was a king who was coming in peace. They were expecting a warrior. In their eyes, he should have been on a white horse, but he's on this donkey riding into Jerusalem. He is literally declaring, I am king of kings, and I'm not here to destroy. I'm here to bring peace to you who have lived in darkness, to you who have been in bondage, to you who have been abused by the host of hell. I come in peace. He's declaring that to be his, his kingdom. 
So if you're following in your notes, number one, the king has arrived. It's a powerful picture. Jesus rides into Jerusalem on this donkey, which literally is a beast of burden. But it, it is a beast. This donkey is a beast that is ordained to serve. And Jesus said, I didn't come to be served. I come to serve. This is, this is different than the normal king you see or you, or you read about. I already said that he was coming on a mule because he was coming in peace. In 1 Kings 1 and 33, David says to Solomon, uh, take my mule and ride my mule on your coronation day. David had a donkey that he rode to declare times of peace and that he had come uh, in peace, whether he came to a city or a town. Solomon, when he becomes king, is brought into Jerusalem to be declared king on David's donkey. Jesus is riding into Jerusalem, and he is declaring, I am the prince of peace, and I'm bringing peace to you. You, know, you notice that prior to that, Jesus was... He always, when he worked a miracle, not always, but oftentimes when he worked a miracle, he would, he would say, don't tell nobody. He's keeping it down low. But, you know, somebody that was deaf but now hears or somebody had leprosy is now set free, it's really hard for them to keep quiet. So the word always got out. But Jesus was always like, no, 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 Shh. keep it low. But not today, not on Palm Sunday, not on this day. He has head high, shoulders squared back, and he is letting it be known that he is the King of kings and he is the Lord of lords. And he's entering into Jerusalem, even as the scripture has said. So he's humbly shouting, your king is here and he loves you. This is why when I look at Jesus, I see him as a beautiful picture of meekness itself. You see, he, he holds all authority in his hand. He's calmly riding into the city of Jerusalem to offer himself up uh, to death on a cross. Not because he was guilty, but because we were guilty. He was coming to this city to die that he might set us free. I love this quote by Alan Hood in the, His Excellencies of Christ. Meekness is power under control. It is the restraint of power for the accomplishment of a higher purpose. Did you hear that? It is the restraint of power for the accomplishment of a higher purpose. Meekness is possessing power, yet refraining from using it. This is the picture of Jesus riding into Jerusalem. He's coming because of redemptive purpose that's hidden deeply in his heart. He loves us. While we were yet sinners, he died for us. All for this redemptive purpose. You know, I've said for weeks now, I've talked about people being lost. We talk about sinners being lost from God. And, and the simplest definition of lost is it's something's not in its right place. You know, I always got my keys in my pocket, except when my keys are up here. And I say, have you seen my keys? Because to me, they're lost. They're not in their right place. And you were born, you had a place in Christ. It's reserved for you. But if you're not in that place, you're what we call lost. Jesus looks at all humanity and he doesn't want anybody to be lost. He wants everybody to be in their place right next to the Father. And I just think it's amazing that we all fit there. So he's riding into Jerusalem with all, this, all of this meekness, knowing that he's going to die. He can, he can uh, avoid it all should he desire to do that. But because of love in his heart, God is love, because of the love in his heart, he would not let himself do that. In meekness, he rides in to Jerusalem. Now, think about what Pilate said. 
Jesus is standing before Pilate, and Pilate says to Jesus, don't you know that I have the power to crucify you? And me, in my mind, I see Jesus kind of chuckle a little bit and go, you only have the power the Father gives you. He's saying that to Pilate. Pilate's going, don't you know I, I have the power to crucify you? You only got the power the Father gives you. In fact, watch this. This is fun. You'll like this. Jesus says uh, in Matthew 26 and 53, I could have called more than 12 legions of angels. I could have called more. Everybody say more. I could have called more than 12 legions of angels. Now, legion was a Roman word that referred to 6,000 soldiers. I could have called more than 12 of those. 12 times 6 is 72. 12 times 6,000 is 72,000. Jesus is saying to Pilate, Look, I could have called 72,000 angels to come and deliver me. Well, let's take it a little bit further. We know that in Isaiah, uh, where is it? It's in my notes. In Isaiah 37 and 36, one angel obliterated 185,000 men in one night. So Jesus is telling Pilate, I could have called more than 72,000 angels, and that would be enough to destroy 1 billion, 110 million men. That's more than the population of earth <laughs> in Jesus' day. Are you hearing this? So we're talking about meekness. Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem incredibly meek because he's got the power to obliterate it all. But he's not drawing on that. He has control over the power and the authority that's been given to him. Meekness is power under control. Meekness is love openly displayed. How could this one man, think about this now, how could this one man, Jesus, be so strong and yet so tender as to stoop so low as to death on a cross? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's what he's saying. And right now, today, on Palm Sunday, he is revealing himself as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, all power over all things, yet he is meek. He's saying, I come in peace. I could come and wipe you all out, but I come in peace. We have to see this because Jesus is trying to demonstrate to us the nature of our Heavenly Father. So many people and so many Christians live under the fear of God that God's out to get them. Well, let me just say he is. But he's out to get you into his kingdom. He's out to get you into the right place. He's not out to get you. He's not out to destroy you. The nature of the Father, Jesus says, is this meekness that I'm riding into Jerusalem with. I come to bring peace to your soul that's at war. This is what I want you to see about Heavenly Father. That's what Jesus is demonstrating as he's riding into Jerusalem this way. Such tenderness. Meekness is who he is. Mark 10, 45, he came not to serve, but to be served. We see in John 12, he washed the feet, dirty feet, 
of his disciples. In Matthew 11, he describes himself as meek. I am gentle and lowly in heart. Come to me, all you who are heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. This is all coming out of meekness. When I think about this meekness, I think about the tenderness that God speaks to our hearts and reveals to us when we're getting closer to salvation. The closer I got to January 6th of 1980 when I gave my heart to the Lord, the more I was sensing the presence of God and He was being absolutely, incredibly merciful to me. I was beginning to know I do not deserve this love. I, I just, I, I, I can't comprehend that you would love me the way that I am. And he's like, yeah, that's exactly right. You can't comprehend it. And even when you're born again, you won't understand it because it'll be wider than your mind can go, deeper than your mind can go, higher than your mind can go. That's how my love is towards you. I'm thinking, man, he should just put me over the fires of hell and destroy me. Jesus is going, no, 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 no. That's not the Father. The Father is the exact opposite. We, we, as in Jesus and the Father, are going to these great extremes as to death on the cross in order that we could be delivered, saved, born again. Jesus is the picture of meekness. Let me show you some fun scriptures that illustrate this as well. Zechariah 9 9. That's quoted most uh, cross references of the triumphal entry of Jesus. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteousness and having salvation is he. Humble, there it is, and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So Zechariah, years and years and years before this moment in Scripture that we're looking at today, is prophesying to Israel that your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey. Then you can go to Psalm 118. Turn there with me, if you would. Psalm 118. Psalm 100. 18. And let's go to verse 19. So Jesus knows the scripture. And Jesus, knowing the scripture, would have remembered this one right here on this Palm Sunday. Verse 19 says, Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is a messianic psalm speaking about Messiah coming through the eastern gate. Jesus came down off of the top of Mount Olives on that donkey, and he rides into Jerusalem in the east, through the eastern gate. Do you know what that gate is called, the eastern gate? It's called the gate of mercy. <sighs> like You can't make this stuff up. Open to me the gates of righteousness. The only way you, we're going to get in, into that mercy is through His righteousness. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. You see, when you enter the gate of mercy, this was what was typical in Jesus' day, when you came through the gate of mercy, you went right to the fortress of Antonia, uh, the Roman fortress, or went right into the temple. Jesus comes through the gate of mercy, and his next words are out of this, out of this psalm is, uh, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. It was typical that when you entered the gate of mercy, the eastern gate, coming into the temple, you would give thanks. You did, it's just an, it was a natural thing. You don't have to think about it. This is a response to mercy. This is the response to God's mercy that the hands would go up and we would give thanks as we enter the gate of mercy. Let's keep reading in this psalm. Psalm 118, verse 22. 
Uh, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. That's a famous passage. You also read it in Ephesians 2 and 20. As Paul is teaching, Jesus is our cornerstone, the chief cornerstone. That which Israel rejected has become the cornerstone of our salvation. It's become that point that everything else is built from that. Verse 23 says, This is the Lord's doing. Did that do anything to your heart? This is the Lord's, this is God's doing. God set this up. God planned this before the foundation of, of the world. And it's marvelous to our eyes. Now here's a scripture, the next one that you should be familiar with, because I say it all the time. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Where does that passage come from? It comes from this psalm that is prophesying about Jesus entering into Jerusalem to lay down His life for us. This is the day that the Lord has made. It's marvelous in our eyes. God planned this so that we would be freed from our sin to walk in, into a relationship with God. Gets my heart excited. The Lord's doing marvelous things in our eyes. Let's rejoice. We get to uh, Psalm 118, verse 26. Though rejected by the people... He, Jesus, was blessed who came in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. I just wanted to see that out of the Psalms. When we talk about this meekness and how Jesus rode into Jerusalem, there is already a pathway for him to follow in the word. Then we go on back to Genesis 22, Abraham and Isaac. Genesis 22 and 1, God says to Abraham, Take now your son, your one and only son, go to the land of Moriah. Do you know where the land of Moriah was? Mount of Olives, Temple Mount. God is saying to Abraham, Take Isaac to what will be the Temple Mount one day and sacrifice your son there. Abraham says, All right, I'm in. We're going to do this. So he gets some servants. He gets... Isaac, his son, and in verse 3, Abraham saddled up a donkey. Guess what? They rode a donkey out to fairly close to Moriah, almost there. When they're almost to Moriah, Abraham says to his servants, You stay here with the donkey. We will walk over there. We will worship and return. <laughs> Love that faith. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, but he walked up to Calvary. When he handed off the donkey to his servants, he took the wood that was going to be used for the sacrifice and he placed it on Isaac's back which is a picture of Jesus carrying his cross to Calvary. And when a man was crucified, and the only time a, a man carried a cross was when he was condemned to die. Jesus carried his cross to Calvary. Now, I stand amazed at all that, knowing that at any time he could have called 72,000 angels who at least had the capacity to take out 185,000 each. And he goes, I'm going to hold that back right now. Because he had us in mind. At any moment, any time, Jesus could have backed out. But love compelled him. Love sent him to the cross. Last point, coming in for a landing. The power of meekness. Go to Psalm 37. Psalm 37. Verse 5. 
Du, 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 du. Doesn't look right to me. Yes, it does. Psalm 37, verse 5. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him, and He will act. When I think about meekness, I think about the power of meekness. And write this down. You'll use it this week. Meekness flows out of surrender. Write it down. Meekness flows out of surrender. Jesus had committed his way to the Father. And the words we see here, trust in him and he will act. A characteristic of the meek is that they trust in God. Meekness flows out of surrender, but it starts by trusting God. The meek commit their way to Him. Meekness commits its way to the Lord in the confidence that He will use His power and mercy to do good. Jesus committed His way to the Lord in meekness, knowing that the Father would use His power to do good to raise Him up from that grave. Meekness flows out of surrender. Verse 7, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. The meek are quiet before God and they wait for him. Meekness waits patiently and quietly for the outcome. Think of how often Jesus was quiet before his accusers waiting patiently for the outcome of all that the Father had purposed. The meek don't fret. They don't worry over the wicked. Meekness doesn't give way to anger or to worry when faced with opposition and setbacks. Jesus, think about what he's about to go through. Beard ripped out, crown of thorns, nails, beating. Did he get angry? No. What came out of him was, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So if meekness flows out of surrender, surrender flows into power. Meekness flows out of surrender, and surrender flows into power. Jesus was the silent lamb that was led to the slaughter. He was silent before his accusers, but he was resurrected from the tomb. I believe that we can learn from Jesus today meekness. Controlled power. Meekness flows out of surrender, so the more I surrender to His Spirit. It's been my, my prayer for a couple of weeks. God, increase my capacity to surrender. Meekness flows out of surrender. And surrender flows into power. Meekness allowed Jesus to be quiet before His accusers. Because he knew his father's plan. And just like Abraham knew that we will go there and worship and return. Those were his words. We will worship and return. Abraham was convinced that God would raise. Go to Hebrews to find this. Hebrews 11. He was convinced that God would raise Isaac from the dead. A picture of Jesus. In meekness, going to the cross, knowing that the Father would raise him from the dead. Now, how does that apply to you and I? In meekness, 
when, when we invite people to get saved here, enter into a relationship with the Lord, I ask that people step out, walk down here, and I share some scriptures and we pray together. Meekness is when you surrender and you say, I'm tired of living for me. I'm done with my own power. I'm done controlling my own life. I am surrendering that to the Father. And you take that step of faith. Abraham surrendered to God. He took that step of faith. He was ready to crucify or to take his sacrifice, the word. Sacrifice his own son. God said, no, 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 no. You don't have to do that. I have one that I've already set aside before the foundations of the earth were laid. And his name is Jesus. Your meekness begins when you surrender to him. You step into that power, his power, the power of salvation, the power that delivers the soul from death by faith. All happens in a moment. Let's stand. Father,